Welcome back to Monitors Unboxed for another Q&A session. We are now in April of 2023, so last one of these sessions was, I think, a little bit over a month ago. But anyway, plenty of questions to get to in this video. Thanks to everyone that submitted them on our YouTube community tab, or also in our Discord community for our Hardware Unbox supporters. So we'll be answering some of the most highly upvoted, most requested ones in this video. So without further ado, let's get into it. First question, I think this is one of the most heavily upvoted questions on the YouTube community tab. Understandably, monitors are designed for horizontal setups since that would be the use case the vast majority of the time. How much does image and or text quality change when turning a monitor to a vertical orientation? Would the subpixel layout make a difference? For example, RGB versus BGR. And have you found any models that you would recommend for vertical setup? So yeah, obviously this is a, po a popular thing that people do for a secondary monitor. You have your primary monitor in a standard orientation, secondary monitor vertical, which is, makes it a bit easier to read documents, view websites and things where the horizontal space doesn't really do much for you. So when it comes to image quality, I guess there's two factors that come to mind in terms of what would make the most impact. The first is the subpixel layout. Of course, we've talked many times in on the channel about subpixel rendering and subpixel text rendering and how those systems, at least on Windows, are designed to utilize the RGB subpixel layout that we see on the vast majority of LCDs. So if you've got RGB laid out in that orientation and then you turn the whole thing 90 degrees, you no longer have that RGB stripe. The subpixels become stacked on top of one another. So the subpixel rendering techniques that Windows would use probably not going to be very effective. And that's what we see when we use vertical monitors or really any of the other orientations. Some people will rotate their monitor 180 degrees or use it in vertical orientations on either direction. Yeah, just the text won't look as crisp and clear as what you'll see with a vertical, uh, sorry, a horizontal monitor. And there's really no monitors that I'm aware of that are optimized for that sort of setup. The vast majority of LCDs will use RGB stripe, or in some small circumstances, you'll see BGR as well. But because both of those, again, are going to be have the, the pixels stacked top to bottom when used vertically, it's not going to have that much of a difference in terms of you know, image quality for vertical use. So that's the, the primary thing I'd be concerned about. But as a secondary monitor, it's probably not too much of a big issue, especially if you're buying something that's 4K, where the pixel density is quite good. If you're using, say, 1080p or 1440p vertically, you may run into those pixel quality issues and text rendering issues, but 4K, typically from what I've seen, it's been perfectly fine. The other issue is viewing angles. Typically with monitors, you know, you have viewing angles that differ whether you're viewing it horizontally or viewing it vertically. So there are some monitor technologies, like VA for example, where one of those viewing distances is a lot better than the other. Same with TN, the vertical viewing angle tends to be worse than the horizontal viewing angle. Both of them not great on TN, but with TN monitors, almost the, the second that you're tilting, viewing it up or down the wrong direction, it looks quite bad. So I'd want to monitor with really wide viewing angles, especially really wide vertical viewing angles, so that when the monitor's off to the side and you're sort of looking at it and, and glancing at it, and you're maybe not viewing it straight on, that it's not immediately washing out or giving you terrible colors. I think most IPS monitors today will be fine with that sort of thing because IPS has pretty good viewing angles in both the horizontal and vertical direction, but there are some monitor types where you may want to think twice about that. Obviously, curved monitors as well, not great for vertical setups. That's where the majority of VA monitors are today. So those are the sorts of things that I'd be looking at. But yeah, as you say, most monitors are designed to be used horizontally, the normal way, and turning it vertically may cause a few issues here and there. I am a 32-inch monitor fan, and I cannot wait for an OLED monitor in that size. When do you think we can expect to get 1440p or 4K 32-inch OLED monitors? 27 inches is just too small. Yeah, certainly feel your pain there with the lack of OLED variety at the moment, especially for gaming and at those sort of normal sizes. The good news, at least what we're seeing from some of the OLED panel manufacturer updates we've seen over on TFT Central lately, they are a great resource for looking at what panels are in manufacturing at the moment or in development at the moment and what we can expect to see in the next couple of years. Both the two main OLED manufacturers, LG and Samsung, they are both planning 32-inch 4K 240Hz OLED displays, at least based on the information that we're seeing over on, on TFT Central. 
So Samsung, obviously that would be a QD OLED variant, LG, most likely W OLED. And so from that perspective, it's good that we know that there are panels in development that will meet the criteria of, of you and your use cases here with your 32 inch OLED. The downside is that the LG panel, while we do know it's in development, is unlikely to be available before the late parts of 2024, and the Samsung model has no ETA at all. And this is really where you're probably going to have to be waiting at least a couple of years, even if we're thinking about late 2024 for the panels to become available. That's probably early 2025 in terms of actual monitor designs. Typically, panels will come out six to 12 months before we see them in actual shipping monitors. So if LG is saying, hey, we'll probably have this ready late parts of next year, then you'd expect early parts of 2025 is when those monitors uh, would be released. So you're still a couple of years away. If you want the OLED experience right now, I don't think it's necessarily worth waiting that long. You're probably better finding a monitor now that is going to serve you for those two years. But if you can wait that long, then at least there are some, there is some information of panels coming in the future that will support that. Two Tech Guys asks, what do you guys think about the ratings article or artings? I think it's ratings, but either way, they're, they're a big testing website. What do we think about that article that found a faster burn-in on QD OLED TVs and what impact could that have on monitors? So this is a question that's been asked a lot. Um, we saw it in this Q&A, obviously it's been asked across a lot of our other videos as well about the, the QD OLED versus W OLED on ratings. I think there's people who are potentially panicking a little bit at the results we saw from their test and reading a bit too much into it as to what it could mean for monitors. I think it is a useful test for the TVs that are being tested in that article. But as far as whether that is going to inform and give us a really good insight into what's going to happen on monitors, I'm not 100% sure. So if you're not familiar, over on ratings at the moment, they have, I think they're testing about 100 TVs in a longevity test to see when the products will fail, what happens to things like backlight brightness. And obviously for OLEDs, that's going to include burn-in as well. And there's a number of W OLED panels from LG and QD OLED panels from Samsung included in the testing. The reason why I don't think it's going to be super informative for monitors is that it's not just the panel technology itself that influences the burn-in rate for those displays. It's also the implementation of that technology. And you even see that in the ratings testing where they have W OLED TVs from multiple brands that have been burnt in at differing rates. The LG TVs, so the LG ones that use their own LG panel, are seeming to burn in less quickly as opposed to say a Sony TV that uses the same sort of W OLED panel. So if we're seeing that between two different manufacturers using the same technology, then there's probably some other influence there as to what's causing the burn-in. Potentially LG has better compensation for things like you know, logo detection, just reducing the brightness a little bit for static elements and not causing as much burn-in, whereas the Sony TV may have a less robust feature or no feature at all. I think the TV maybe doesn't even have that feature included, but that's one area of obvious difference. Also as well, things like pixel refreshing, pixel cleaning, pixel, you know, servicing features that we see in these monitors. The times that those are activated for how long, when they switch on and off, differs between manufacturers as well, and that could have some influence over the longevity for burn-in, and also pixel shifting as well. How does that operate? How frequently does it shift? What are we seeing there in terms of operation? Some TVs may not include that feature. So if we're already seeing between two TVs that use the same sort of panel technology different burn-in factors, then that may also apply for monitors because what we see across many monitors is that they do indeed have differing features for sort of the, the burn-in compensation features. There are monitors that do have logo detection and monitors that don't have logo detection. There are monitors that have quite often pixel refreshing and pixel cycling features and the monitors that will bug you and annoy you like the AW3423DW into using it at times that don't make sense. So you may skip that, it may burn in a bit quicker. Pixel shifting as well. Some monitors have additional provisioning of pixels around the edge so you don't lose some of the screen area when it's shifting around. Some monitors don't have that, which means that you may be more inclined to disable that feature for desktop use so that parts of your screen aren't being cut off. So just from the features perspective, it could be the case where a QD OLED monitor that does include features like, or let's say it includes all the features. It has pixel refreshing, it has 
logo detection, it has pixel shifting, that may burn in less quickly than what we see from an LG W OLED monitor that has none of those features. And because there is a, a much wider variety of manufacturers implementing these OLEDs than what we see on TVs, with TVs there's only you know one to three manufacturers using a given technology, maybe four, um, to, you know at least for the, the major brands. With monitors, we're seeing, you know, I think the LG 27-inch, you know, 1440p, 240Hz OLED, we're expecting that to be utilized in at least four to five brands. QD OLED, we've seen that used in, I think it's four brands at the moment across five displays. There may, may be more coming in the future as well. There's a lot of different implementations that may play into that. So that's one thing to just keep in mind there with these burn-in tests is that it is going to be indicative of the implementation of the panel and the rates of burn-in may differ depending on that sort of thing. The other thing that I saw with the testing is the use of maximum brightness for all of the monitors or all of the TVs in that testing, I should say. So what this means for the burn-in test is that we see W OLED panels typically have lower brightness than QD OLED panels. So if both monitors are being run at their maximum brightness, there'll be a difference in brightness. And the way to get more brightness out of OLEDs is typically to increase the voltage. And things like diodes can tend to have non-linear characteristics. So increasing brightness may come with a comparatively higher increase in the voltage that's required, which may wear out those components faster than at a, a lower brightness. So this testing is interesting. I think it's it is a valid way to test burn-in, but it's also not going to be as indicative of maybe real-world use cases. Well, it's hard to say that because there are some people that will run both monitors at maximum brightness and that may be buying QD OLED specifically for its superior brightness to LG OLED. So if you're testing that, say, 250 nits versus 200 or 180 nits on W OLED, maybe that is a real-world case because, like I say, some people will be buying QD OLED for that feature. But also there are going to be people that are not going to run the monitor at maximum brightness. I find QD OLED for my use cases at maximum brightness to be too bright. So I turn it down a little bit. And that's where equalized testing could also give some insights into burn-in. With changing the monitor technology, so having one variable being is it W OLED or is it QD OLED, and another variable being the brightness, one monitor being brighter than the other, it makes it hard to extract that single variable and to know whether it was W OLED versus QD OLED that was causing accelerated burn-in, or was it the higher brightness of QD OLED versus W OLED that's causing higher brightness? Would W OLEDs burn in faster if they were allowed to run brighter? We just don't know based on, on that sort of maximum brightness testing. If there was a test that had equalized brightness, both running at, say, 150 nits or 200 nits, I think maybe W OLED would struggle with 200 nits in some circumstances, but you know, you get the picture, you equalize brightness, that would really tell us which technology is more or less susceptible to burning. You run them at the exact same output, you know they're showing the physically the exact same image on both screens, which one burns in more quickly. So that sort of testing hasn't really been done for QD OLED versus W OLED at this point. So that's all of my sort of thinking into the rating test. I think it's a very useful test, especially for, as I said, people buying those TVs. It's going to be very indicative for the specific TV models that you're considering. But as far as a, a broader examination of W OLED versus QD OLED, yeah, I think we just have to temper the sort of results there and sort of think about what how it was tested, what's been going on, whether that does apply to monitors. I don't think for many people that you should be scared off buying a QD OLED based on the testing. I think there's been, you know, with both monitor technologies, W OLED and QD OLED, we've seen reports from of burn-in from users. I think the big thing for me at the moment is really those burn-in warranties. Um, most QD OLED monitors do have quite a good burn-in warranty of three years. Some, I think most W OLED monitors have really no or limited burn-in warranty. So that's something that I would be deciding on at the moment if I was super concerned about burn-in. What's the warranty like? How long is it going to last? Uh, and can I get a replacement if I see burn-in during that period? And um, that's going to give me the peace of mind more than a test that may not be indicative. And yeah, we see lots of people that use these monitors and see no burn-in. So yeah, I think it's a very interesting test. I'm really keen to see how ratings goes, you know, in a year from now once the testing is much more further along. I know they're, they're adding some of the monitors to their testing as well, so that will be really interesting for the results there. So yeah, lots of interesting stuff, lots of testing to go to see exactly how these panels perform in terms of burn-in.
Next question, if it's not necessary, why do so many monitor manufacturers lock out white balance control in their sRGB modes? I think this comes down to two factors. The first factor being that some monitor manufacturers believe that their sRGB mode is really well calibrated out of the box and they don't want people adjusting the calibration values. So if they've gone, oh, we've put in all this effort to make this mode look really good, why do we need to give people access to things like white balance when that may you know, create an incorrect sRGB mode? It may actually break performance, make it worse, and make it not an sRGB mode. So I think that's part of the reasoning. But I think a bigger reasoning is simply that the capabilities of the scalers used in some of these monitors is not sufficient to allow things like gamut clamping and white balance adjustments at the same time. Scalers, so the scaler is part of the display components that does a lot of the processing that you see, things like, you know, it's called a scaler because if you take a lower resolution, you try and upscale it to the native resolution, the scaler is the piece of hardware that does do that. The scaler runs the OSD and various other features in the monitor. So the scalers are not particularly powerful bits of hardware. They're a chip that has a very limited set of functionality. They're designed to do very basic things with monitors. And it can be as simple as running two different transformations on a monitor at the same time. It's just not supported. One transformation being, let's reduce the colors. So let's reduce the limits of the colors that we see, which was going to reduce the color gamut down to the correct gamut for that particular color space that we're talking about. And then the second transformation is where do we need to shift all the colors to correct the white balance? And if those two transformations are not supported at the same time, then you're not going to be able to run an sRGB mode with unlocked features. And I think that is really the main limitation. Now, as to why that's limited, I'm not 100% sure. I know that things like memory space can be very limited on monitors. So potentially, you know, there's memory limitations there for saving two different matrices. And yeah, just the, the processing power not being functional. And potentially as well, a monitor manufacturer may be, or a scalar manufacturer may be telling the monitor OEMs, hey, our, you know, OS, our scalar doesn't can't do this. It's not powerful enough to do this with other features. Or if you want to implement feature X, Y, and Z, that feature is, you know, we don't have the processing capability to do that. So you're not going to be able to do that on our hardware. And even if it was still possible, you know, they may be taking that guide and sort of using it and saying, hey, well, the scalar manufacturer is telling us we can't really do that. So we'll not allow that to happen. Typically, the monitors we see that do have the ability to run your sRGB mode and have a you know white balance controls tends to be the most powerful processes. So things like G-Sync modules, it can be possible to do on those monitors. Monitors that use TV hardware, so things like LG C2 42 inch. Um, we've seen it lately from the Samsung Odyssey OLED G8, which uses you know smart TV functions. The more powerful the processor, the more it can do tends to make those features more accessible. I would like to see scalers get more powerful so that they can support white balance adjustments and you know gamut clamping at the same time or have more manufacturers enable that if it is possible. But at the moment, it seems that most manufacturers are just keen on including the sRGB mode, ticking that box and calling it a day. Can you give us a sense of which monitor features make the biggest impact on overall experience? For example, should I be focusing more on Hertz, 10-bit color, response time, HDR, or can you suggest how I might be able to figure out which are most important for me? So yeah, this is, I guess it's, when you see monitor reviews, they've got a lot of data. It's hard to separate which specific areas of the reviews make most sense to you. But also answering this question is quite complicated because it really depends on what you're buying a monitor for. You know, things like gaming versus video playback versus productivity and desktop apps. There's all going to be different aspects to performance that matter for each of those tasks. And even within a task like gaming, for example, it could depend on whether you play fast-paced competitive multiplayer games versus slower-paced single-player titles. For multiplayer gaming, I'd probably prefer things like response times and refresh rate so that motion clarity is really clear and fast. Whereas for single-player games, I might prefer things like color quality or HDR performance where I'm more interested in the visual output of the monitor. So as a general breakdown, if I look across all the things that we test in the reviews, the motion performance side of things is most important for gaming. So if you're interested in response times, refresh rate, input latency, and things like the UFO test, how clear does the monitor look, that's going to have the biggest benefit for gaming because that's where you're more, most likely to utilize 
the highest refresh rate capabilities of the display. For video playback and desktop use, it does have a smaller impact. It is, you know, higher refresh rate is going to make it smoother to use the desktop. It's going to make text scrolling clearer if you have faster response times, but it's not going to be as important as for gaming where you'll be moving around very fast, you'll be shooting enemies and things like that. So for response times, when we look for sort of the lowest performance there, we're looking at it from a gaming perspective. Refresh rate as well, we want the highest refresh rate so that on LCDs and OLEDs we get the clearest image, which is going to give you the competitive advantage, really, in multiplayer games. You're going to see the enemy on screen in terms of more, there's going to be more samples, so it's easier to target. It's going to be clearer to see where they are. It's going to be less blurry. And again, that's going to improve the gaming experience. For things like color gamut and color performance, it's kind of a multifaceted thing. The color gamut, it's not as relevant for desktop productivity apps outside of creator workloads because most of the time your desktop is going to be sRGB, SDR. It's not going to be utilizing the full wide color gamut. So, you know, things like that, again, it's probably not too much of a factor for most of these use cases. But then the color gamut is important for HDR, which can impact things like both gaming and video playback. If you want the widest gamut, the most impressive colors, then you're going to need to make sure the color gamut is as high as possible for gaming and for video playback. In terms of things like color performance and color accuracy, those things, I mean, it does differ. I'd say for creative workloads, like if you're editing photos and videos, then color accuracy is going to be the most important factor because you really want to make sure that what you're showing on your monitor as you're creating that content is also what other people are going to be seeing on their calibrated displays. You need to make sure that when you're mastering content, that you're not doing weird things that are going to look terrible on other displays. So that's where accuracy would be the most important, but it also has impacts for things like games and video playback, where you want the colors to look as intended. One of the things we normally see with color accuracy, for example, is oversaturation. And oversaturation can impact things like video playback, where my face might look really sunburnt and red, and that's because the monitor is extending its colors into the reds too far and oversaturating the image. So color accuracy, yeah, it is important across most of these aspects, but maybe for gaming, it's not as important as motion clarity and refresh rate, and you should be prioritizing the, that side of things. Again, for things like, you know, 10-bit color support, that's mostly a creator workload thing that has the biggest impact there. It doesn't have as big of an impact for things like video playback and gaming, but it, again, it can have an impact. It just depends on the exact workload that you're looking for. And for things like HDR, I would say that that has the least relevance for people using monitors for desktop use, unless you're specifically mastering HDR content, in which case I probably wouldn't recommend an HDR gaming display. Then the HDR side of things, you know, for you know, web browsing, email clients, pretty much irrelevant. It's really for gaming, video playback. Those are the two main workloads that I would consider. And then for gaming specifically, more towards the single player side of things where you're going to be using HDR, you're going to be enjoying the visual experience, and you're not going to be as concerned about spotting enemies because HDR can make it a little harder to spot enemies in multiplayer games especially if the you know the shadow detail is really cranked up and you're getting that high dynamic range thing it can make shadow detail you know make it look too dark which makes it harder to play the game so those are sorts the sorts of areas that I think of when I'm sort of assessing monitor performance overall as to what matters but realistically each of the areas that we test has benefits and you know cons in each of the areas as well it's just a matter of how much you prioritize it because like I said Running a monitor at 360 hertz for productivity use is awesome. It feels super responsive. Text scrolls so clearly and nicely. It's just a breeze to use. But is it super important for editing documents to have it as a 360 hertz monitor? It's going to improve the experience, but it's not essential. Whereas for multiplayer gaming, you may say that 360 hertz is very essential, especially if you're playing you know, competitive games and you really want to win, then those high refresh rates may make a bigger difference. So. Yeah, that's sort of how I would assess it. It's definitely important to get a balance of all the different aspects when we talk about monitors. And I tend to recommend the monitors that are the most balanced for that reason. But yeah, hopefully that just gives some insight into where the testing that we do, you know, how that impacts you and your buying decisions. Ricardo asks, how dim is too dim? I assume this is a question coming about because of OLEDs and a lot of OLEDs not having sufficient brightness. I think for most SDR usage, most desktop app usage and you know indoor usage, 
that a brightness between 100 and 200 nits is where most people are going to be using their monitor. Um, I personally use it more towards the 200 nit end of the scale, but for people in dimmer offices with less lighting, more towards the 100 nit range is gonna be more how bright you'd want to run the monitor. But then again, there are some people that want a super bright experience because they're in a lot of ambient light, the room is very bright, maybe there's sunlight in the room and you need to cut down on reflections and things like that. In which case, I would say for sort of brighter rooms and environments that up around the 300 to 350 nits is probably where you'd want it. But again, I'd say for the vast majority of people using their monitor in a normal room, normal conditions, that somewhere around that 100 to 200 nits is where you'd want to see it. But certainly you'd want to be offering 200 nits, which is where some of those LG monitors um, do fall down a little bit in their brightness. Certainly for glossy panels, again, that's another aspect that can impact how dim or bright a monitor needs to be. A glossy monitor at around 180 nits is probably not going to be bright enough for some people in normal conditions. For HDR, these days I would say minimum you need to be targeting around 600 nits for that bright, dazzling experience. I think 1,000 nits is also obviously a very good target for people, and there is a noticeable difference between 600 and 1,000 nits with more diminishing returns above 1,000 nits. But certainly I'd be wanting to get around 600 nits plus because that's where you start to see those, you know, those big differences in highlight quality and highlight brightness versus shadow quality, which gives you that dazzling HDR experience, the high contrast experience that we want to see from HDR. So yeah, 100 to 200 nits, probably 200 nits minimum for SDR usage, and then 600 nit minimum for HDR. At least that's where I think of when I'm talking about reviews and the sort of guidelines that I go by. Are there significant differences between OLED displays that we can find in phones when compared to monitors? What about laptop screen OLEDs and other smaller form factors? Anything interesting there that could show up in monitors in the future? I've seen this question, sort of variants of this question talked about a fair bit, especially the phone OLED side of things, because people have phone OLEDs and they don't see as much burn in, which I think is more down to not so much the design of the display itself, but how it's used. Monitors tend to be used for longer periods of time than phones. So, you know, you may have a screen on time with your phone, say three to four hours a day, whereas a monitor, you may be using that for eight hours plus a day, which means the monitor is more likely to burn in. Also, you know, phone apps have dynamic content and a lot of different things going on on the screen where often almost the entire image can change between apps. And I think that helps a lot with burn in as well. You know, even on my Samsung phone, for example, the icons at the top of the screen that you would think, oh, that's surely going to burn in, you know, those are displayed white in dark mode apps, and then they're displayed dark in light mode apps, which I imagine helps to balance out the, the burn-in experience. And these are things that Windows, for example, doesn't do. It's always showing you that taskbar and those apps unless you change some of the settings in Windows to accommodate for that. So as far as you know, phone screens and phones go, they typically use AMOLEDs with a pentile subpixel layout. Pentile typically means that we're not getting three subpixels per real pixel on the display, which means that some subpixels are shared between pixels. And it may be a ratio of say five subpixels for every two real pixels versus what you see on desktop OLEDs where you still get six subpixels for every two real pixels. I don't see that technology making its way to monitors anytime soon. I don't think it's really suited to monitors because we already see text clarity issues with the subpixel structures that we do have for OLEDs and Pentile only makes that worse because you don't have as many real subpixels. So sharing the subpixels causes you know, a lower effective resolution, low effective text clarity and things like that. And as we've seen, it's not really necessary. The reason why they use it for phone screens typically is to increase the density and things like that. And on a phone screen where densities can be 300, 500 PPI versus on a monitor where it's more like 100 to 200 PPI, you don't really notice as much of the issues with Pentile on those sorts of uh, configurations. So yeah, I don't think that phone OLED technology will be coming to desktop anytime soon. Laptop OLEDs as well, you know, obviously they're more dense. We have 4K OLEDs for laptops that are 15 inches, 17 inches. I think it would be great to get the density of those laptops in, you know, desktop monitors. But, you know, things like the subpixel outs that we see from those monitors is also, you know, they use interesting and unusual layouts there. Triangle RGB or different orientations of the triangle. We see those on some of those Samsung OLED displays that they use for laptops. So yeah, again, I, I, I think the density is something that could come across, but 
in terms of pixel structures and things like that and improving things like burn in, I don't think it'll be that much different to what we're seeing on the desktop at the moment. With the rise of OLED gaming monitors, do you think that screensavers might make a resurgence to prevent screen retention and burn-in issues, or do the current techniques employed by panel manufacturers and monitor makers, like logo luminance adjustment, pixel refresher, screen shift, do they do enough? Um, I certainly don't think that for desktop use that those features alone are enough. I think for TVs it is probably enough because of the dynamic nature of the content that's being displayed. Often a lot of input devices will have things like you know, they turn off after a certain period of time, or those TVs have built-in, you know, screensaver features where they will show a variety of images over time. You know, people use the smart TV apps. It's all integrated nicely into those things. And actual screensavers, like we used to see in the CRT days, CRT days, I should say, um, you know, those things aren't as common for TV applications. Like, it's just not as important. I think for monitors, though, where, you know, let's say you're using it for productivity use and you you get up to go get lunch and you're, you're away from your desk for half an hour, yeah, you probably should be running a screensaver on your OLED then, or at the very least switching it off. Now, whether or not it's a screensaver versus just turning the display off is, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think turning the screen off is probably better than running a screensaver because OLEDs can turn on very fast. You're just not using any of the pixels, so you're not causing any wear. Whereas with the screensaver, because the OLED is still being active, the pixels do have the opportunity to wear. Now, it may wear in an even way so that you're not seeing burn in, but you're still nevertheless using the panel. So I think my preference would be for desktop use just to automatically turn off the display after a certain number of minutes. I usually set my monitors to three or five minutes with OLED displays. I think that's a, a good compromise for, for most use cases. But yeah, obviously screensavers, if you want something nice to show on that screen while things are while you're not doing anything with it, then that is certainly an option. Um, but yeah, I would say that if you're using an OLED on Windows and you are concerned about things like burn-in, you should definitely be turning the display off or running a screensaver after three to five minutes. Tim, I noticed in your 27GR95QE review that you still strongly recommend against OLED for general desktop purposes. Do you see this continuing to be the case well into the future? What things would need to change? I bought an OLED TV recently and really love to have an all-purpose 27-inch display that has deep blacks of OLED without too many compromises. Yeah, totally agree with you there. Um, yeah, will this be the case well into the future? I think with current technology, so if we're looking at QD OLEDs, W OLEDs, with the pixel structure that we have today, the densities that we have today, and the susceptibility to burn in that we have today, then certainly I would continue to not recommend OLEDs for productivity use just based on what we've seen so far from these technologies. It would have to be you know, an advancement in the technology. Can we reduce burn in somehow? Can we make the pixels more efficient? Can we change the subpixel structure to improve burn in? I, I don't know. Something like that would have to change to really change that discussion. But I think there are some things that could happen that would improve the desktop experience. For example, what we see, a big complaint that I have, especially for W OLED monitors like that LG, was the subpixel structure. We see that that causes text issues, text fringing, and those complications for desktop apps. Now, if we wanted to get really good tech clarity, one of two things could change. Well, actually, there's a couple of things. They could change the subpixel structure to be a standard RGB stripe. That would make it a lot more usable for desktop apps. They could make the monitors more dense. So if we saw 4K at 27 inches, I think the subpixel issues would be a lot less of a deep, big deal and you'd get really nice text rendering on those displays. Or alternatively, Windows could op be optimized for text rendering on OLEDs. So if any one of those things changes, I think that will make it much easier to recommend for things where it's text ha text heavy and you really need that good text quality. But certainly as things stand now, all those three are probably issues at the moment. The burn inside of things, obviously that's very complicated as well. I think we'd probably need to see either like warranty guarantees extending. So for example, if you had a five-year warranty that included burn in for a particular OLED display, I think that could give people peace of mind that, hey, it's been guaranteed for five years. I should be able to use this for my desktop apps and have no issues. I should be able to use it for productivity. But as things stand right now, where we've got three-year warranties, a three-year warranty is okay, but it's still a bit on the iffy side, we do know that QD OLEDs and W OLEDs can burn in for desktop app use. And just the process of going through a warranty return is annoying. So you'd want pretty robust peace of mind through a warranty to, to really guarantee that. But 
I suspect that burn side of things is going to need a panel technology advancement, something that you know, it's a more efficient diode, more efficient LEDs or OLEDs, as we should be calling them, I guess. Um, yeah, once that happens and burn-in is a bit alleviated, then yeah, hopefully that happens. But as far as what we're seeing at the moment, I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Final question, could monitor bezels be improved anymore, i.e. thinner borders or less obtrusive designs? Yeah, I think this would really help out monitor designs. You know, we've kind of been stuck in this position for a while now where most monitors have very similar sorts of bezel sizes. They're not super thick on the majority of monitors, but certainly they look pretty similar and we don't get the nice super thin zero frame. You know, monitor manufacturers talk about having zero bezels and zero frame bezels and stuff. It's never really the case. But if we were to see some really nice super thin bezels, I think we would see you know, quite a compelling monitor design. It would be very attractive. It would look great. And I think people would be interested in buying monitors based on that sort of feature. The reason why I don't think we see as much of this happening comes down to a few factors. One is the durability. If you have very thin bezels and pixels very close to the edge, that could potentially break, um, especially under, you know, standard wear and tear. And things like shipping, it could break on the edge right there and destroy the, you know, the quality of the panel. So having that little bit of a buffer zone does improve the durability. So they'd have to work out some way to make it super thin without affecting the durability. What we also see is that one side of the panel, generally speaking, has to have the actual connect connection output to the, you know, the controllers and scalers on the display you know, motherboards, for lack of a better word. So one edge of that typically has to have those cables coming out or wires coming out on one side, which is why a lot of monitors have sort of that thicker bezel on the bottom and thinner bezels on the other side. It's because the bottom of that panel has those, you know, that connection coming through. Sometimes we see what's called the sort of four-side bezel-less monitors. They still have a bezel, but four-side bezel-less, you know, it has the same sort of dimensions of bezels around all sides because those panel connections are integrated in a slightly different way. But most panels are three side borderless with the connections at the bottom, in which case we see those larger bezels at the bottom. So I'm sure all of those things could be improved. You could have a different sort of connection method, more like the four side bezelless method, and then thinner bezels that are more durable. I think that would create a really nice looking experience. But yeah, it seems like most manufacturers are sort of content with what we've got now. So I don't expect too much change there, unfortunately, but yeah. Monitor manufacturers, if you're watching this, please give me a nice super thin bezel monitor. I'd, I'd really like that. All right, and that does it for this April Q&A on Monitors Unboxed. Like I said at the start, thanks to everyone that submitted questions via our YouTube community tab or our Discord community. If you are interested in becoming a Discord member to ask questions, not just for this Q&A series, but we also have a dedicated monitors channel in there. You can chat about all the latest releases and ask questions about monitors in there. It's a really great place to hang out. I have a lot of fun chatting with you guys in there. If you're interested in signing up to the Discord, we do have links to our Patreon and float plan in the description below, which gives you access to the Discord, things like our monthly live streams, with myself and Steve over on Hardware Unboxed. We have BTS videos, been making a few more of those lately. So yeah, it's a good place to go. Thanks everyone for watching to the end of this Q&A video as always, and I'll catch you in the next one.